So I'd just like to welcome you all to this uh, NIOTA seminar tonight on the Transforming Experience Framework, Organisational Role Analysis and Abductive Logic. And I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic experience for us all. Um, Susan, uh, my, my first task is to int introduce our presenter, Susan Long, <clears throat> who I've known now for 15 years. I think it's been quite, quite some time. I first did the Masters at RMIT with Susan and she recently supervised my PhD thesis. Susan is the Director of Research and Scholarship at NIOTA. She was formerly the Pro Professor of Creative and Sustainable Organisation at RMIT University in Melbourne. She has published 10 books and many journal articles, including the Transforming Experience in Organisations, which is the topic of her work with us tonight. Susan's chapter on the Transforming Experience Framework and Unconscious Processes in that book is so well worthwhile um, having a read. She really gives a beautiful overview of the development of our understanding of the unconscious and our unconscious processes. There's a great deal more I could say about Susan, but you've probably already read her bio or know her yourself in the, on the NIOTA website. So I'd like to say something of my experience of Susan, if that's okay. okay. Um, as I said, I was incredibly fortunate to have Susan supervise my research. <laughs> Her generosity as a supervisor really enabled me in every way to trust my experience and to be faithful of the genre that I was writing from and grappling and learning with me. Susan is always interested in what you are thinking and reading and is a lifelong learner, which makes her a wonderful educator and creator of new knowledge. So I welcome you, Susan, and we're looking forward to working with you and hearing more. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. And uh, it was a delight to supervise your lovely thesis. Thank you. I'm going to uh, put up some PowerPoint slides and I'll share my screen with that. So I'll talk a bit to that. I'll also talk a bit to some notes that I've got. I've based this talk as, as organisational role analysis using the transforming framework experience. I, I owe a lot to the Grub Institute for their transforming experience framework. Uh, how I use it I, is my own uh, way of uh, using it. So um, all laudation to them and any problems to me. Organisational role analysis, as I use it, is an exploration of role using the transforming experience framework and a psychodynamic approach. It was first developed by staff at the Grubb Institute in London. That's an exploration of a role using transforming experience framework and a psychodynamic approach. It involves, the way I use it, a collaborative exploration between a coach or an organisational consultant and a client or client group. It involves associative and systemic thinking. The aim of this work is to uncover the dynamic nature of the role, not to solve problems as such. The underlying belief is that by understanding the dynamics of the role, the solution to a problem will begin to reveal itself. I'm going to look a bit about um, some of the theory frameworks and methods used in organisational role analysis, and then I'll walk through actually how I use it. But bear with me because the theoretical underpinnings of the method are important because there's no exact recipe to follow. We can't put out a recipe for role analysis. There are principles and guidelines and if you understand these the role exploration starts to follow. So I'm going to go through a little bit about each of these areas theoretically if you can bear with me for that. First of all, I want to talk a bit about the associative unconscious. The associative unconscious, there's a few points up there. Just imagine all the words, signs, symbols, images and ideas known to a human community and potentially able to be in that community. Imagine them in a vast network of interconnection, a network studied by semiotics, where all are connected through threads of associations. Imagine a tapestry of meaning. Just as in a dictionary, where all the words are described in terms of other words, all associated and connected, because you only understand a word by referring 
few other words, they're all connected. And just as in mathematics, where numbers are interconnected and gain their meaning in relation to one another, just as in nature, where organisms in an ecological system interconnect to form ecosystems, so imagine this network of words, ideas, signs, images and symbols. This is the associative unconscious. Its entirety is not available to any one member of that human community. An individual thinker or imaginer has access only to some part. This is due to their individual experience, education, capacities, and the whole of their background. Much of the network may not be available to most people because of personal memory, repressions, psychodynamic repressions, intolerances, social taboos, Whole sections of a community may not have access to large sections of the network because of group or societal beliefs. The idea of gay marriage, for example, is there, but was not thinkable to most 50 years ago. So too, many ideas in science are there in a nascent form, but the technology may not yet be available for such ideas to be realized. The network is there, past, present and future, implicit in our capacity to symbolize. It's what David Baum, a scientist says, ideas are thoughts that are implicate in the network. That means that they can be emerged, but are not necessarily immediately accessible. Hence, in a particular community, a scientific community, for example, an artistic or even an everyday colloquial community, the same idea may emerge in quite different places because of the readiness of that community to receive it and the capacity of thinkers to think and intuit those ideas. So you often get in science the same idea emerging at quite different places in the world. And um, my hypothesis is that the associative unconscious is there and those communities were able to access the ideas. But although this network seems to exist in its own right, a system of thoughts, ideas, symbols, and signs, it's not independent of living, experiencing people. It exists between and within them. The logic of the associative unconscious is grounded in experience, in the nature of existence. The only way to access broad swathes of the associative unconscious is for members of the community to pool their ideas, images, signs, symbols, and experiences. Think of the idea of a house. You may have an image, a word associated with bricks or wood, or a home or a family. You may remember experiences of being in houses, their smells, the feel, the surroundings, your emotions. But fuller meaning of a house and all of its connections that themselves have connections is achieved by sharing images, signs and symbols about houses. Because of such experience, each set of associations and connections is different. Access to the associative unconscious is via stories, art, discussions, scientific or otherwise. I use socioanalytic methods, including reflective practice and social dreaming for such access. Okay, so that gives you a bit of an idea um, of what I mean by the associative unconscious, which I think lies under a, a lot of um, the work we do. I want to now talk a bit about abductive logic. Organisational uh, role analysis, as I use it, applies what Charles Peirce describes as abductive logic. In a general sense, abductive reasoning begins with a set of observations and derives what might be the most probable explanation for their occurrence. We use it in everyday life. It, it uses in everyday hunches and guesses based on past experiences. For example, someone might say, the hole in the front lawn must have been made by the dog. He's done it before. But in the philosophy of science, the meaning is not so much about justification for
for conclusions reached as about hypothesis formation. Abductive logic for Peirce is the first step in scientific knowledge, the only step that is creative and is the basis for hypothesis creation. It begins with what he terms a surprising fact. Some observations surprise us and we seek an explanation with what Gordon Lawrence later refers to as a working hypothesis. In surprising circumstances, ideas may come out of the blue or from left field, from obtruse observations, from obtruse associations and connections, and may be used as a likely explanation when there are no others. This is the, the notion of, um, I'll just see if I've got, no, I'll go back to that. This is Peirce's uh, formula. He says a surprising fact C is observed. But if H were true, C would be a matter of course. So hypothetically, H is true. Kepler's observation of animalities in the path of Mars, he saw them. So he thought it would, must be an elliptical path because that was the only explanation that could work. Darwin's observation of diversity and similarity in species led to the theory of evolution through mutation and adaptation to ecological niches. The hypothesis can then be tested using deductive and inductive reasoning and scientific method. But to reach the surprising fact is not simple because habitual perceptions fill in gaps and we see or hear what we expect to see or hear much of the time. Observing facts, uh, observing, sorry, surprising facts requires an open mind and as beyond following Keats the poet puts it, to use negative capability, to be without memory, desire or an irritable search after meaning, a state of mind completely in the present. Then once the surprising fact is noted, a meaning becomes available through associations and connections, not the kind of um, deductive idea. Um, Ginsberg calls this a conjectural knowledge. He explains the method with reference to an Italian art historian in the late 19th century by name of Morelli. Morelli developed a new way of authenticating paintings. Prior to Morelli's work, paintings were authenticated by an artist's typical choice of subject or setting. Morelli looked to the small details, the way an artist painted a hand, a fingernail, or an ear, the small strokes of the brush or pen, elements of the painting that emerged, as Morelli himself said, and I quote, by force of habit, almost unconsciously from the artist and could not be deliberately re replicated. Interestingly, we know Freud read Morelli's work as a young man. His book, the Morelli's book, being found in Freud's library. But what significance did Morelli's essays have for Freud? Um, Ginsberg says, Freud as a young man, still far from psychoanalysis, tells us that the proposal of an interpretive method based on taking marginal and irrelevant details as revealing cues, clues, was taken from Morelli. Here details generally considered trivial and unimportant beneath notice furnish the key to the highest achievements of human genius. And uh, Freud said Morelli works in the way that I work in psycho later on in psychoanalysis. Interestingly, or perhaps pertinently, Morelli was originally a physician, as was Freud. And Ginsberg points out how medicine primarily uses this conjectural method and abductive logic. It involves the use of surface clues to find underlying causes. Ginsberg compares the methods of Morelli and Freud and also of detectives, charmingly, exampling the work 
of the imaginary Sherlock Holmes, who despite author Conan Doyle's claiming Holmes as deducing his solution, actually uses abduction. Doyle was also a physician. This abductive logic or conjectural method seems to be a primary way in which psychoanalysis works. Small omissions or unusual connections are noted in a patient's associations. A verification comes later when, with insight and change, mutative change. So too with organisational role analysis and systemic change. During an action, I'll give you a small example. During an action research project in a prison, the research team had made a rule that no one member of the team would go into an area with prisoners by themselves. If escorted by prison staff, they would always go in twos in order to debrief together later. On one occasion, I broke the rule as my colleagues were not available during a visit. It was a high security unit for sex offenders. Although passing without overt incident, it proved to be quite traumatic for me as a social worker whose role I was exploring at the time, upon our leaving the unit, spelled out for me in some detail the crimes, some of which were quite horrific, committed by the inmates with whom I had been talking. Suddenly the details of the ways in which they had looked at me or had spoken to me became shocking. In all of this, the most surprising fact for me was that she convinced me to go into the unit with her when I had already been clear about the rule which I had made for the safety of the team. Was it, I thought, just my own hubris or my struggling after meaning that made me break the rule? Later, upon debriefing, I realised the extent to which I had been subjected to a projective identification from the social worker. That is, she wanted me, perhaps unconsciously, perhaps not, to directly experience what she felt in role. She had earlier said that her role was hard to describe and I should come with her to observe, to observe as she did her rounds. I had agreed, despite our rule, of not going alone. My experience reflected what she experienced in her work, only she had had time to build the defences that I was woefully lacking. I got the full brunt. I had been seduced into going into the unit, groomed, as it were, into being the person who might know her pain in role. And we continued our role analysis uh, work later after that incident. Okay, now I, I just want to move to the, the third thing I've talked about, um, abductive logic, I've talked about the associative unconscious. I want to talk a bit about working socioanalytically because that's the way I work socioanalytically in role analysis, whether it's with an individual client or with a group of roles in a consulting project or a research project. Just as uh, with psychoanalysis, socioanalysis works conjecturally, and I use Ginsberg's term, in the first instance. It involves noticing the surprising, which means being in a mindset where you can be available for the surprising and not just see what you want to see. Finding patterns uh, in the material that's, that was being worked with allowing new ways of seeing and being willing to uh, develop hunches may or may not be proved to be supported later on. These methods generate meaning through understanding the clues, finding patterns in seeming chaos or unconnected occurrences. They work with the unconscious in dreams, drawings, photos, films, music, associations, metaphors and patterns to come up to the surprising fact. Their aim is to generate working hypothesis, the first step in scientific inquiry. After, uh, after reading Ginsberg too and understanding 
abductive logic. Um, I, I remember when I first read Freud, um, which was my first year of university, and uh, how excited I was with his case studies. And uh, I went and told my partner, this is like reading a detective novel. And I love detective novels. And I must admit, I'm unashamedly a watcher of detective shows on television. And I love the way that cl clues are used. And when I came to abductive logic, and working socioanalytically, I, I could see the link with so socioanalytic and psychoanalytic thinking. Socioanalytic methods give access to the associative unconscious, the infinite of thought, through abductive logic. They are methods that generate associations and find interconnections using chaotic, seemingly unconnected bits and pieces of human phenomena as clues. As an interpretivist method, and I follow interpretivism following Shapiro and Carr, as an interpretive method exploring subjectivity, the insights they provide and the actions they support and engender um, are their validation. In the case of ORA, organisational role analysis, they enable clients to find the systemic purpose of their roles and to make changes. Just give you a little example. A client, a defence lawyer, drew her role as juggling many coloured balls. Such an image is not uncommon in roles where many complex demands are there. She was able to discuss this complexity quite openly and had drawn the role quite consciously in this way. However, she had not drawn any features on her face. Was this surprising? At first, she dismissed the absence of features, saying it was not important. The drawing was simply schematic and not representational. But upon my insistence, she explored the meaning of being faceless in a court setting and how such facelessness came into her roles outside the court, sometimes losing her friends, and how being expressionless in court was seen as professional. She said that the way her clients looked and their expressions in the dock had a great effect on judges and juries, and she'd always advised them on their expressions. And upon further reflection, she said that although she kept her emotions in check, they nonetheless were often quite intense. This exploration with the role drawing, the socioanalytic method, led to a discussion about the importance of her feelings in a case and her reactions to a particular bullying male prosecutor, which we then examined further in the role analysis. The picture had unwittingly led her to the emotions and uh, experiences of being faceless in the system and what this meant for both her personal and work life. I'll just go now to the last theoretical part, the transforming experience framework. This is a model, not a theory. It makes no hypothetical predictions but gives guidance for an exploration of the dynamics within organisational systems. I owe my understanding of this to the former Grubb Institute and its staff, then becoming the Grubb Guild now closed. I use the model as background to ORA. The model describes five domains of experience. The experience of being a person, the experience of being in a system, the experience of being in a role, the experience of being in a context and the experience of source, which isn't in this drawing, but another one that I'll present later. These are not necessarily exhaustive domains. There may be others, but they're central to organisational analysis. Here I'll just touch on the model as it is explained more fully in a book I edited, The Transforming Experience in Organisations, a framework for organisational research and consultancy. Role is central to the model because it's in role that a person can take actions on behalf of the organisation and instigate change. And I, that's one reason why role analysis is so important. Roles mark the place where people in an organisation stand 
in relation to one another. This is different from relationships between people. The relation between roles is always mediated by the tasks associated with the roles. One may have quite different experiences as a person and as a person in the role. Often workplace and ethical dilemmas are experienced because the role calls for one thing when the personal experience or values call for another. And you may have experiences of this yourself that you can discuss later, where you're torn between your own set of ideas and values and that the role is calling you to do something different. And I, I, I think I can think of situations. I'm, I've been thinking a lot about, um, done some work with the fire services and, and how we, we talk about people going into situations that call for bravery and how in your person you may experience a lot of fear and anxiety. But if the role calls you forward to do something on behalf of others, perhaps to save somebody or to save some property, um, often the call of the role can be quite strong and people are over to, over, able to overcome their own personal anxieties. Each of the domains in this puts pressure on the person in their role and the person in role makes decisions that can influence each of the domains. Role analysis can explore the experiences in each of the domains, find surprising observations and patterns and develop working hypotheses about the dynamics surrounding the role, the system in its context, and working hypotheses about how the person takes up the role and is influenced by source. Source is the deepest value of values in the model by which a person in role operates. This diagram is also in the book if you, if you want to find it. It may be religious. I think it's certainly spiritual and provides a guiding source of decisions and actions. Source may have to be discovered because it's mostly unconscious, even though having conscious presence in a set of purposes and values or in a deity. The source is what, uh, the experience of your source is what does ultimately guide you. I want to go to, from those uh, theoretical background issues, which you may have some questions about, I want to now go more sort of pr practically to tell you a bit about how I actually conduct a role analysis. And again, as I said, there's no formula. Um, this is just the guideline for, for what I do and um, how anybody might take it up. I think you just need to uh, read a lot more and um, bring it into practice in that way. Setting up and discussing your approach is important for the client. It establishes the context in light of the transforming experience model. You must remember that you and your client or clients are not simply exploring a work role, but you yourselves are taking up roles in the system with a context and a source. Exploring the here and now of the ongoing role analysis along with the work role explored is part of the process. So once you set up with your client or clients, you're uh, entering a new system, the system with them, and it's in the context of the role analysis um, that will be there. So you've got a dual um, piece of work. You're working with the role that the person brings for analysis and you're working with uh, the situation that you're in. So setting up and discussing my, my approach, I use, I talk about confidentiality, although that's implied, I think um, needs restating. Talk about the setting that the work is being done in. I talk about it being collaborative, that we're working together. Uh, I find this really important because when you're just working one-to-one -one with, with somebody, it often just again leads into that relationship stuff rather than into uh, having a third space where a person, which is the role analysis, where a person feels less threatened and um, together we can look at the work. We're looking at roles in the work. I talk a bit about what I mean by elaboration, associations 
an amplification of the material, that that's important, that it's not just a something that we do that detracts from the work, but is actually part of the work. Talk about what we might mean by interpretation and by whom and how we make meaning. And talk about developing working hypotheses. And then I often give a sketch, uh, an early sketch of the TF model and talk about the experience in the different domains. I often give an example where I have some feelings. My son once asked me to help him watch a um, video for us for a university assignment. We had to look at characters and he brings out the video and it looked a bit violent. And mum says, mum roll says, I don't want to watch this. It's violent. Mum likes watching comedies. And he said, bless his heart, mum, I don't want you as mum. I want you as a psychologist. Oh, says me. Yes, get into the psychologist role. That's what he needs. In the psychologist role, I could watch the violence. Didn't worry me at all. I could help him. I could do whatever it is. And I've actually come to understand that when we're in the experience of a role, we can think different thoughts than what we can experience in a different role. Different roles invite us to think different things. Different roles allow us to have different feelings. And so with role analysis, I'm always um, asking people to be clear or say if they're going into a meeting or something, what role are you in at the moment? What's, how's the experience coming to you? What's being, what's, what's calling you in that role? And, and thinking, I'll go into this a bit more when I talk about systems too. So I'll, I'll just ask them to think about what system they're going into. So, all right, so we get a, a, in the setting up process, get some agreements about time, place, number of sessions, costs, of course, and any other considerations. But in the beginning, what, what role or roles are to be worked with? And I get perhaps the person to describe the role, the system and the context. And there are many work roles that we're in, uh, many, many work roles. There are many different systems that we're in. There's the work system and you might be in the work role system. You might say, oh, I'm, uh, okay, I'm an accountant in an accounting firm and I do mainly whatever kind of accountancy it is. You might also be in that culture in um, a political system, small p political. All offices have their office politics. Um, I, I'm used to working a lot in universities and boy, do they have their politics. And um, so I might say, we'll do a role analysis. So I'm a, a, an English teacher in a university. Um, if I'm going into a meeting, I'm going in with my English teacher role on, but I might suddenly find I'm in a meeting where politics, the office politics are playing out and the system might be calling me to take up a political role. Now, whether I do take that up or I'm seduced to take that up or whether I call back into the work role is something that has to be thought about. I might get the, maybe not the first session, but might early on get somebody to do a role drawing, draw their role, just like I discussed with the, um, the lawyer earlier on. And we'll say, draw yourself in your role, in the system, whatever verbal instructions you give for a role, uh, that will have um, an important effect on the way the drawing comes out. And I've done drawings in all sorts of ways and sometimes got people to draw other people's roles um, to get a deeper understanding of how they understand somebody else's role. And then we work together looking into the role drawing and seeing what's surprising in it, what's uh, important in it. Many of you may have worked with role drawings and there's a nice um, article in the socio chapter in the Socioanalytic Methods book by my colleague on drawing, Bridget Nossel. Then we might work, is there a challenge in the role? What are the challenges in the role? 
we work towards understanding from the role drawing a hypothesis about the role. How is this role serving the system? And again, I say the different systems. You know, how is it serving? Particularly, we want to look about how it's serving the work system, because that's the primary task of the task system. But how might the role be serving the politic, political system? How might the role be serving the economic system? How might the role be serving the social system or the social um, technical system in the organisation? There's lots of exploration that can be, can be done around that. Um, and then we might look at are there connections between the work, work role that we're exploring and the ORI system as it's involving, unfolding. That is the way that the two of us are working in the ORA. And if it's an ORA, ORA is working with a, a group, might look at their connections there and the ongoing work with the group. Um, then I take the transforming experience and start thinking about the experience of person in the role. So I might do a couple of sessions or maybe more and do a role biography. And I've written about role, bi role biography in a few different places. It's really about exploring the roles people have been in through their lives and what connections that they, they are with the current role, what patterns have built up through their roles. Um, talk about maybe finding, making and taking a role, which is another concept taken from the Grubb uh, Institute. How does the person find the role in the system that they're in? How do they actually make it um, and, and bring themselves into it? How do they take the role and the authority and the accountability that the role has? And then we might look for a working hypothesis about the person in the role. How's the role being taken up by the person? What are the demands of the role? What's the fit between the person and the role? And um, go through, through the notion of the experience of the person in role. Then we might understand, and we might do it in this order. This is just the sort of things that it might jump around, a bit like I tend to jump around in talks sometimes. Understanding the experience of being in the system What's the purpose, tasks, authority and accountabilities in the system that impinge upon the roles of the role, role being looked at? What's the culture of the organisation and its subgroups? If you want to take um, the, the notion of what are the artefacts of values, behaviours and assumptions, Edgar Schein's model, we might look at the culture. We might look more deeply at the culture if we've got to that stage of thinking about basic assumptions and more psychodynamic ideas. So then we'll start looking about what the hypothesis is about the system in the light of the purposes of the system. So again, moving, the first one was a hypothesis about the experience of the person in role. This, we start to develop hypotheses about the system and then start thinking linking that to how is our ORA system progressing. And we might think about the experience of being in the context. And what is the context, the social context, the physical context, the economic, the political, the environmental, technological. And think about the, the context that this role is um, being taken up within. And of course, a lot now is the COVID context that's being impinging on the work role a lot because people are working from home and working in quite different environments, quite different boundaries. The um, boundary between home and work is, is less definite for people. Um, the social context is different because of, of COVID. Um, the physical con is different. And for many people, economic and political and environmental and technological uh, contexts are all impinging upon the way in which we're taking up our work roles at the moment. So we might start working on a hypothesis about the context and its effects on the system, the role and the person. Finally, we might review the various working hypotheses that we've developed about the person experience, about the 
system experience and the context experience, we might talk about the experience with source if um, when we get to that. I, I, some people feel quite comfortable about moving there, other people less so. Uh, and then we review the ORA system. So that's generally how I work. And, I, and I've tried to bring at times different socio um, dynamic sorts of concepts into it so that we may move to some of the other socioanalytic methods and think about them. And sometimes people want to work on more than one role. They might want to work through one role and then think about another role. And I've had some clients that I've worked with over long periods of time who have done analyses of several of their roles and then started looking for many patterns between the different roles. Finally, look at using ORA in organisations. I've done each of the following. I might have looked, worked with a client or client system who may wish to explore a series of roles and how these interact. I've looked at several roles in the system that can be analysed to get at a deeper sense of the system, the prison one we talked about earlier. Different roles may be involved in what we call, it, what we call role dialogue, where roles are able to talk to each other. People are in role and we set up a system where they can have a dialogue between their roles to understand their roles. Um, teams may explore differing perceptions and conceptualizations of the many roles in the team. Many of these may go undiscussed because the discussions become personalized and blame, blame is given to persons rather than to complexities in roles. So it's worth exploring from a role perspective Organisational processes such as induction or performance assess assessments can use short forms of role analysis. In the former, that is in um, induction, and we did a project with this at one stage, um, to understand anticipations that people have about their roles. And during the induction period, you can use a, a short form of thinking through that what their expectation of role is from the different personal system context source perspectives. And in the latter performance assessments, you can separate out the changes needed to roles from the success or not of the person occupying the role. And we've published some of this called Me and My Role of some work that was done in performance assessments where we separated out the first first session was done with really looking at the role, not looking too much at bringing the person into it. What changes are needed to the role at this time? How's the role being affected? And that is far more successful than a kind of a tick the box approach to how you're doing in your role at the moment and is it going well and so on. And then the second session might be looking at how the person is going in that role and how they might move towards the changes that the role might be, bring about. And here I'll give you, this is the third example. The first example I gave you was the prison example. The second was the lawyer. This one was in a hospital department. In a hospital department, an action research team that I led explored the experiences of different team members from the experience of their roles. We found that many of the difficulties experienced in the departmental teams resulted from their not finding ways to communicate the needs of each role to the other, other roles. For example, patient appointment times seemed never to be coordinated between cardiologists and radiologists, such that patients could not be seen by both groups on the same day. And many would have to travel, patients that is, from country areas into the city on several occasions. And this would seem to be a very simple issue, but they have been working on it for about two years and didn't seem to be able to resolve it. The attempts to coordinate successfully always became doomed from some reason or another. We engaged them in an open space process that allowed them a self-organizing system to bring forward this and other issues 
where their experiences in roles could be openly discussed together and solutions began to be found. We, we did this in a way that um, instead of starting from how can we solve the problem, from saying let's explore in depth what the roles are like, what's the experience, how do people in those roles experience the, uh, the way they're working, what are the thoughts and feelings that come to them as they try to work. They then had to rethink their team leadership processes, where in workshops they each drew pictures to depict their understanding of the other roles in the team, especially the leadership roles. This led to a deeper understanding of what the roles demanded and how they might make changes. And it was only then that they were starting to be able to come together to work um, on how they could solve some of the problems. And that problem of actually organising the times that, of, of appointments for the patients, that was solved within two weeks um, after they'd been struggling ever for years. And it was something to do with the cardiologists and the radiologists, just not simply, uh, if you want to put it this way, getting how it was to be in the role of the other and to deal with dem the demands that that role brought about. I think that's much of what I, I want to say. Thank you all for coming tonight.